neuroscience in the last few years has been making a tremendous contribution to the understanding of a whole variety of issues which relate to art and to the visual arts in particular. For example, we now know vastly more than we ever have about how the emotions work, how we respond not only to others, but also how we respond to representations of things, how we might respond, for example, to pictures of things. We know a huge amount more about vision, how vision works. We know about the relationship between, for example, the perception of color and the perception of movement, whether in life or in a film or in art. The new cognitive neurosciences, what we in our conference are calling the new biology of mind, has made extraordinary strides in the last few years in and of itself, you know, irrespective of whether it's related to the arts. This is one of the most exciting areas of the sciences. There are many developments in the new neurosciences which pertain to art. And I've been saying to my colleagues in the humanities, the time has come to listen to what's going on in the field of the sciences. The time has come really to bridge those two cultures about which C.P. So Snow spoke 40, 50 years ago um, because of the relevance of the findings to our understanding both of creativity and our responses to art. Now, one of the motives for this conference was that most neuroscientists, especially the well, most neuroscientists are also interested in the arts. They're cultured people, they think they know about culture, they do know about culture. Um, on the other hand, people in the humanities, especially academics in the humanities, are somehow suspicious of science. They think that it's too positivist. They think that um, it will reduce the sort of gritty nature of human, the gritty nature of human creativity. They think that everybody responds differently according to their historical situation, according to their social situation, according to their particular state of health. Um, so there's a great deal of hesitancy to incorporate the new findings of the cognitive neurosciences in the traditional fields of the humanities. And my motive for first setting up an art and neuroscience project at the Italian Academy, which I direct, and then to set up a series of conferences and fora was precisely to get these two sides to talk to each other. They aren't talking to each other, and they should. One small area that seems to me of very profound relevance for our understanding of the arts. And this was the discovery by a team of neuroscientists at Parma University in Italy about 10 years ago. And they discovered that when a macaque monkey observed the action of another monkey, in the first instance, the goal-directed action of another monkey, like reaching for a plate of fruit or reaching to touch some other monkey's shoulder, anything like that, they discovered that when another monkey observed a goal-directed action, the same neurons fired in the observing monkey's brain as would fire as if that monkey were, the observing monkey were executing the same action himself or itself. This had extraordinary ramifications in all areas of human life. I mean, the mirror neuron researchers within a few years realized that it could possibly relate to our feelings of empathy for others. If you feel that you are suffering like this and you somehow bodily, inwardly imitate that action, this leads to an understanding of the other person. When I um, first read about mirror neurons, I thought to myself, well, this must obviously be applicable also to the way we relate to paintings. If we see certain gestures within a painting, for example, sometimes we have the feeling that we are doing this ourselves. And we now have a neuroscientific basis for this kind of bodily empathy that some beholders feel when they look at a, at a picture. Because we can tell exactly what neurons fire in the brain that control the same areas of the body as that which the spectator is beholding in the picture or the sculpture. We are standing at the beginning of extraordinary paradigm shift both in the sciences and in the arts. This is an ex amazingly exciting moment in which for the first time we will clearly be able to see the ways in which science can illuminate our understanding of art and of our responses to art and therefore the ways in which Students of the humanities, artists, musicians, composers, writers can inform the neuroscientists of the vagaries of human behavior and the varieties of artistic production. But it's above all an exciting moment because it never has the possibility of science illuminating art been as clear as it is now.